These were instruments that we took in a second airplane, Chuck Sweeney's airplane. They were on parachute. They were instruments that the scientists had invented to measure the force of the blast and send it back to the mothership. The Japanese to this day will claim, a lot of Japanese will, that the bomb was dropped by parachute. It was not. What they saw being dropped by parachute were the instruments that were dropped out of Chuck Sweeney's plane. Then finally, we were told that we had to get pictures of the bomb when it exploded. That was a nice trick. So we put a th took a third plane along with us and that sort of thing. That's, and they that had a, one of these new fast, just get this called fast tech cameras now. It's supposed to fire at about uh, a very rapid, a very, very rapid uh, take and this sort of thing and get a perfect picture. They, George is supposed to be sitting up there flying toward the target and get perfect pictures of the bomb when it exploded. George Mark Marth was exactly where he was supposed to be that day. The camera didn't work. The only pictures, I have a picture in the book here and everything, but the only pictures that we got that day were pictures that were taken by George's navigator with his own little browning camera. <laughs> so much for all the expert and scientists and scientific activities. They were the plans. We also sent out three airplanes over three different targets beforehand so they could radio the, info the weather information back to us. We'd have to go up there and stooge around from one point to another over Japan trying to find a target was open. A lot of you probably heard of a guy that was in our group called uh, Buck Edelin. His book was written about him, a Hiroshima pilot. Buck Edelin was not the Hiroshima pilot. All Buck did was fly the weather airplane over Hiroshima that particular day. But he didn't post to getting enough publicity, so he got out of the service. He tried to rob post office offices and things down in Texas. Texas didn't think much of that, so they locked him up for a long while. <laughs> but anyhow, they, they were the plans. So now we come up to, uh, we finally get word toward the end of uh, July that President Truman had approved the use of the bomb, and that we go, should go ahead and rob as soon as we were ready. To us, that meant as soon as the weather was okay. That day was August the 6th. Everybody wonders now what happened on August the 5th. You expect something big and dramatic, Hollywood, all that. No, it was just a lot of hard work. We had to plan the mission and we had to get everything ready for it and everything like that. Everybody wonders what, it, well, what, what we do on August the 5th. Well, the first thing that happened, we had a briefing early in the morning. I'd say early, 10 o'clock, 10.30 or so. That's early for me. And, uh, so uh, they were told us what we were going to do and everything and everything. What crew was going to do what, take what their assignment was. And then told us to go back and get some sleep. And they called us about 10 o'clock that night for a final breakfast and a final briefing. How they expected to go out and tell you that you were going to go out and drop the first atomic bomb that it might blow up the airplane that you did, that you needed to get home with, and a few things of that type. It's absolutely beyond me. I know I didn't sleep. I know Tom Fairby didn't sleep. I know Paul Tiras didn't sleep. How do I know that? Because we're in the same poker game. I knew you were going to ask, and I know it was so bad, I don't even remember. <laughs> I ran true to form Tom Ferry one. He was the best, one of the best poker players in the Air Force. <laughs> Anyhow, that about, that, that night, about, about 10 o'clock, they go over to get us again. And we'd over to have a final breakfast and, and over to get the final briefing, which was uh, really the latest metal of uh, metro, metro data and everything of that time. And uh, uh, any final corrections on the Air Sea Rescue Unit? And I will say they were trying to protect us as well as they could. They had ships all the way along our route, and even in the Sea of Japan, they had submarines to pick us up in case we had to go down that close to the target. And I only remember Tom Fairby telling me, he says, Dutch, he says, I want you to know where every one of those ships are. I don't want to get my feet wet. <laughs> <laughs> then down to the airplane. Oh, well, first we had a breakfast. Final breakfast. I did not care for pineapple fritters. Paul Tibbetts did. Frank has his privileges. We had 
Pineapple fritters for breakfast in the morning. And then down the airplane. And we get down the airplane, the airplane is all lit up by keg lights. You'd think it was a Hollywood premiere up there. I think I said something about people looking like a Hollywood premiere. Dick Nelson, who was on that film you just saw, was a Southern California boy, and he says, ah, looks more like a supermarket opening to me. <laughs> The point I want to make about that is that there's an awful lot of picture taking, a lot of interviewing, went on for about an hour and everything else. It was not being done by the media. There was not a media person on the island. It was being done by the Manhattan Project. I've always thought it was Leslie Groves getting a film ready in case he had to go before Congress and explain how he lost, spent two billion dollars and got a bomb and didn't work or something. But that, that's what it was for, is for the Manhattan Project, and they recorded everything very precisely. And then we got in the airplane to take off. Now, our takeoff was our first problem. Why? Because we were very heavily loaded. Uh, max, the usual, uh, usual max gross weight of a piece uh, 29 over there was about 135,000 pounds. Our plane weighed 150,000 pounds that morning, and we couldn't extend the runway, unfortunately. So Paul Tibbetts, that's why you heard Paul Tibbetts say in the uh, video team, Bob Lewis at 140 weeks of the yoke to pull back on him. Paul told him to keep his hands off of it. He was flying that airplane. Paul kept the airplane on the ground until we actually had no more runway left. And I hope I remember looking out the window. Tom says, are we flying yet? I says, well, there's water down there instead of land. So I guess we're, I guess we're <laughs> But it was very heavy, heavy, heavy in getting off the ground. And then we stayed at low altitude till we get up to Iwo Jima. Why did we do that? Because Navy Captain Deke Parsons was on board. Deke Parsons had more to do with making our ball than any other individual. He was a minor genius at weaponry and at, at, at cannons and this sort of thing. And he, he practically they did our bomb single-handedly. We had a regular crew of that day, nine people, plus three other people. We had Deke Parsons and there there on the bomb. We had his assistant, Morris Jepson, there to help him out. And we had a third guy, um, Jake Beezer, there for radar countermeasures. Because the radar proximity fuse on that bomb operated on a very unusual uh, frequency. But if the Japanese had gotten on to that frequency by mistake, they could have exploded the bomb in the airplane. We didn't think that was a good idea. <laughs> that's the reason why uh, Jake Beezer was here. By the way, if you ever see, read any of Jake Beezer's books, Jake said, but we were that way while we were on. Yes, you can see some music. Jake said that while we were over the target, a Japanese fighter plane came up and flew alongside of us for a little while, and then did a slow roll around us, and left. I have no idea what Jake was smoking. <laughs> I can assure you, we saw no fighter 